hello everyone. Uh, this is Steve Marinucci, contributor to Billboard and Access.com, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, our weekly roundtable where we discuss the Beatles past, present, and to come. Before we get into our discussion, I'm going to introduce you to my three cohorts in crime, starting in the state of Maine. We have uh, our musicologist who has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and many other fine publications out there, and also is the author of uh, a book on the Beatles uh, himself, Mr. Alan Cozen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. And as Maine goes, so goes the nation. Oh. <laughs> we, we shall say. We, well, we, we proposition, proposition number one, um, recreational use of marijuana becomes legal. Uh-huh. We, have, we have that in California, too, actually. Okay, well, we so as right. California goes, so goes Maine. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, heading down the coast uh, in Connecticut, uh, we have the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Good evening, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Connecticut, the uh, state that brought you Pez. <laughs> <laughs> the nutmeg state. <laughs> Okay. Uh, comparing that to legalizing uh, marijuana. <laughs> marijuana, you don't have you don't have that on your ballot. We're, we're by the way, we're we're talking about we're we're taping this a week before election day. That's why with the political discussion. So, uh, no no marijuana initiative on your on your ballot, uh, Ken. I'm not sure. I'll have oh. to check. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in the in the swing state of Pennsylvania, the uh, which is getting a lot of discussion, we have uh, the executive editor of Beetle Fan, Mr. Al Sussman. Uh, good evening, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And we're we are absolutely being inundated with TV and radio ads. I mean, uh, I've never I've never seen. You know, I haven't been here for a political campaign, but uh, you know, because mm-hmm. I was in New York and New Jersey, but I've never seen so many ads as as I've been hearing and seeing the last the last month. And I mean, it's like, and it's incessant. Anyway, this week we're gonna we got a couple of things to talk about. We are going to discuss a new Paul McCartney song that showed up on the internet over the weekend. Um, it's called In the Blink of an Eye. It's for the soundtrack of the forthcoming uh, movie Ethel and Ernest um, by the author of uh, The Snowman, whose name I don't have in front of me. Raymond but, Briggs. Raymond Briggs. Thank you, sir. And I wrote about him, too. Um, anyway, uh, the the trailer I saw for that looks absolutely gorgeous. It really does. And it's, it sounds like a beautiful story about the author's parents. But McCartney has uh, a song in the soundtrack, and actually there's a second McCartney family song in the soundtrack. Um, uh, I didn't know about this. Yeah. they re- uh, Carl Davis, who did Liverpool, Liverpool Oratorio. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Just had a birthday. Right. Uh, has done a new arrangement of Walking in the Park with Eloise on the album. Oh. Really? Yes. That's very uh, nice. Yeah. So that's that's interesting as well. Um, but anyway, we've all heard the song, I think. Guys, what did you think of it? And I'll start with uh, Alan. Oh, it's nice starting with me. Uh, I, th- <laughs> I think I can muster up my enthusiasm enough to say that it was, um, you know, so-so. Um, but the really surprising thing actually was, you know, we've been talking about his voice for some time. And... You know, live is one thing, but here is a studio recording where he he really sounds kind of tenuous. You know, maybe we should just be getting used to that. Maybe that's just his uh, mm. his, his voice for now uh, these mm. days. But uh, it it I, I found it kind of surprising in a way, and and, and that becomes mm-hmm. a distraction because you you're not really listening to the song anymore. You're saying, "My God, what's going on with him?" You know. So, I, I don't. I don't think the song is that great. It's not that bad. Yeah. But yeah, that is that does kind of uh, that does kind of take away from that. And if you listen to and I, which I did yesterday, I kind of did a comparison with um, "Hope for the Future," 
hope for the future doesn't sound like that at all. It sound, hope for the future sounds great. Mm. Uh, um, and you know, and uh, and also the the song he did for for uh, the the Robert De Niro uh, "I Want to Come Home," mm-hmm. the Robert mm. De Niro film. He, that also, and that, which actually, in my mind, is closer in style to "In the Blink of an Eye" than "Hope for the Future" is. Um, I would agree. I agree. Yeah, on that. Mm-hmm. The one, the one thing though between all three of them is they all have this very dramatic kind of build, which is kind of weird. I mean, even even if you go back to "Live and Let Die," you know, he he always likes these kind of dramatic soundtrack, you know, songs for some odd reason, but. But yeah, come home is very close to in the blink of an eye. But there's no the voice uh, in "I Want to Come Home" sounds really good compared to uh, this, which sounds a little rougher. Mm. And I was actually I was actually watching a um, an advanced copy of Havana Moon, the Rolling Stones movie about the Cuban performance, and I was noticing how good Jagger's voice sounds in that. And I don't know if it's the you know the the way they uh, engineered it or whatever, or the you know the way they mixed it. But his voice on that sounds great, and McCartney's on voice on this does not sound as good. It's kind of it's it's you know it's kind of interesting that that that's happened. Um, uh, Al, let me go. Why don't, why don't we do Ken first? Because I think he like has Ken? a contrary opinion oh. to All right. Alan's. <laughs> right, right, Ken. Why do you automatically think that way, Al? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, as far as the song is concerned, I try not to rush to judgment because even though I've heard the song about 10 times now, I like it. When I heard I Want to Come Home, uh, initially I thought, no, this is nice. It's a good song. It's a good, solid song. And now all these years later, I love I Want to Come Home. You know, mm-hmm. I love everything about that. So over time, your impression can change of mm-hmm. a song or an album. Right. So right. I like this song because I love the arrangement. The string arrangement in the very beginning, done by Carl Davis, is really nice. And one thing that I found to be kind of different for Paul, it's not the first time he's done this, but the introduction, before you even get to Paul's vocals, it's about 50 seconds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's a long I'm, introduction, you know? I'm guessing this is going to be at the end of the movie. I mean, that's that's kind of the feeling you get because they're, because of that long instrumental. Do you guys agree with that? That I that's heard that it's supposed to be possibly. on credits. Yeah, that's what that, that's kind of that's what I was thinking. Yeah, so it's it that's why the vocal doesn't come in sooner, you know. And it's funny the preview that they had on 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 iTunes didn't have the instrumental part. It had McCartney's voice, which was kind of kind of interesting that they clipped that. I mean, basically, they, they, that was the whole preview that they had was just McCartney's voice. But go ahead, Ken. Hmm. Well, I like the song. I'm not going to say it's a great song because it's still too new for me. But uh, I like the whole production behind it. I think it, right now I feel the same way as I did when I Want to Come Home first came out. I don't hear the similarity that some people are pointing out in Hope for the Future. But the similarity in those three songs is that he does like to use orchestration you know, when it comes to uh, soundtrack music, as mm-hmm. witnessed uh, you know, in those three songs. But... Um, as far as his voice is concerned, uh, I am concerned about this, and uh, there are times when it sounds strained. And I think we're really concerned about this because Paul has one of the greatest and flexible voices in, in all of music, and we're so used to how great his vocals are that when it's not as strong, and you can tell from some of his live performances, and now getting into the studio recordings as we witnessed with um, early dates Mm -hmm. when the new album came out and I remember him talking about um, Ethan Johns, the producer there was a a moment in there where he strained to hit a note and he wanted to do it over and Ethan said to him, no, no, leave it in it shows your vulnerability you know, and now it sounds like he's going to keep it that way you know, I'm, I am concerned about the vocals. I don't know what's wrong with his voice. I do think that, you know, you can take good care of your voice, you mm-hmm. know, in, in, in your 70s and 80s. But, um, you know, I do have a comment to make about the Mick Jagger comparison. I don't know if you mm-hmm. want to bring it up now. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really unfair to make a comparison like that because you're dealing with different types of vocals all together. 
You know, Mick Jagger's vocals, what he has to to sing, it doesn't require, it's not really singing. (laughs) You know, it's his own style, much the same way that Bob Dylan's voice. You know, Mm -hmm. he's so the way that he phrases things, the way that he projects himself. It's not like a singer's voice, you know, and it's not as vocally demanding as the songs that Paul has done throughout his entire career. So you're dealing with a different type of vocals altogether. And what's required of Paul, especially in a two and a half to three hour concert, is quite a lot for anybody at any age. Mm -hmm. And so if it wasn't for the fact that he is one of the greatest singers of all time and powerful singers, when you see it start to deteriorate this way, I, I don't blame anyone for being concerned about it. Mm-hmm. I, I disagree with you, though, about saying Jagger uh, is having it, or is not, you know, or his songs are, are somewhat less demanding. Because if you think about Satisfaction, if you think about Angie, there's two songs right there that are completely different, you know, in terms of tempo, in terms of, um, uh, you know, the probably the the demands on his voice and he gets through both of them fine um it's so still not a comparison paul's no. songs have such a um a range mm-hmm. vocally and yeah. you don't have that in in rolling stones music <laughs> it's not that demanding it's not that demanding to sing angie really <laughs> or or any of the songs like satisfaction it's just his style i'm not knocking mick for saying that that's mm-hmm. just what those songs require Okay. And it's perfect for doing those songs. But All it's right. a different type of singing altogether. Okay. All right. Uh, Al? Well, uh, my opinion is closer to Alan's as far as the song itself. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's pleasant. It's, you know, I mean, it's a, a very a nice nice melody. Uh, the, the the string arrangement by Carl Davis is uh, is very good. Uh, it's very nice. As I said, it's got a nice melody, although it's not it's not an earworm. It's um, you know having heard it now several times, it uh, it hasn't you know wound its way into my uh, subconscious the way mm-hmm. other songs. I mean, I happened to mention last week. I for some unknown reason, I spent about two days humming and singing London Town to myself, <laughs> and I don't even remember where I heard it or whatever, but it just. You know, it had just, you know, wormed its way into my subconscious, and there I was for two or three days, humming and singing it to myself. This song does not have that kind of potential. No. Um, it's, to, frankly, I find it in the in the vein of kind of those pleasant soundtrack songs that he's done, like Vanilla Sky, like yeah. I want to, uh, I want to come home. Which uh, you know, I just find it's nice, but it's nothing. It's it's certainly not in the the pantheon of McCartney songs. Hope for the future is much much better. Plus, it's not mm-hmm. a movie. It's not a movie soundtrack song anyway. It's a song from a you know for a done for a video game. So it really right. it's apples and oranges. Um, it's kind of it, treated the same way though. Well, yeah, I think yeah. so. In its I mean, arrangement, right? In, in some of the arrangement, but it's a right. strong, but it's a stronger song. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you. Go ahead, finish out. Well, the the other issue is definitely his voice, mm-hmm. and I and I got to thinking about this, and probably recall that back in 1993 and 94. There were two very successful duets albums by Frank Sinatra that were mm-hmm. released, uh, commercially mm-hmm. successful. Uh, he recorded the vocals. Uh, for people who don't remember, uh, these are albums on which uh, in which Frank did new vocals for a goodly number of his you know his greatest hits uh, and had duets although they were recorded totally separately not nearly at the same time uh as uh, as sinatra's vocals by uh, uh contemporary artists of his like tony bennett but also a lot of newer artists like bono like aretha franklin etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. um now he recorded 
all of the vocals uh, in late June of 93. And when the albums came out, Sinatra's hardcore fans were absolutely appalled because his voice was a shard of what it was. And, and I, you know, looked it up, and at the point that he recorded those two albums, uh, Sinatra was uh, was not yet uh, was not yet seventy eight. He was about seventy seven and a half because his birthday mm-hmm. was in December. So, so basically, he was about three and a half years older at that point than Paul is now. And, you know, obviously, at, in Sinatra's case, he was paying the price for, you know, an entire adult life of cigarettes and Jack Daniels. Um, Paul, uh, over the course of the last, you know, he gave up smoking um, tobacco, at least, um, <laughs> some, <laughs> we hope. Some, some years ago. But in the last, say, 15 years, he has toured almost continuously – and playing, you know, playing large arenas, large stadiums, uh, doing, you know, doing Helter Skelter and, and I'm Down and uh, uh, I saw her standing there and other, you know, other, I'm uh, Oh Darling uh, and other. He's very never done Oh Darling. He's never done Oh Darling? In, in, <laughs> never. Oh, never. Really? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, I'll take that back then. Uh, mm. But he's done, and you know, a number of his, you know, his up-tempo rockers, and some of them on a pretty regular basis. So he's certainly done damage to his to his throat. We've talked about this before. That I, you know, I feel that he should basically stop doing stadiums and large arenas. Uh, and also stop the continuous touring and compress the amount of time that the shows take. But, uh, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that the fact that at 74, his voice is in that kind of condition is probably not surprising. Mm -hmm. You know, although I wouldn't put him in the same comparison with Frank Sinatra either. Well, well, uh, you know, similar, uh, there's similar wear and tear, let's put it this way, although different different kinds of wear and tear. Well, Paul's had one of these vocals that um, is, like I said, very flexible. He does all kinds of vocals throughout his, his career. He can go mm-hmm. from a low voice like in Lady Madonna to a screaming vocal like Monkberry Moon Delight or Helter Skelter to, uh, you know, falsetto vocals. Like that he's done sometimes, like in Girlfriend, you know, it's it's all over the place what he's done vocally. Whereas, you know, Frank is a crooner and he's had tremendous range in his vocal and Mm -hmm. tremendous emotion, which he's very well known for his Mm -hmm. styling in the way that he sings. He was the best at his craft to, to so many people. But I don't put him in the same category as Paul. Whereas Paul's kind of vocally all over the place, right? I'm t- I'm not talking. I'm not making a musical comparison. I'm talking about basically the, you know, the the wear and tear on the instrument, right? And again, in Sinatra's case, it was uh, you know cigarettes and Jack Daniels. In Paul's case, it may have been, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sure uh, the years of smoking that he did do. Um, didn't do uh, you know a whole lot of good to his to his throat, but I have a feeling that all of the touring he's done the last fifteen years has hasn't really done much done much good to it. Mm. No, you have well, an excellent point there. Yep. Well, in, in any in any event, we'll see. We'll you know we'll see what happens when this thing finally comes out. And, you know what was really funny was the song popped up on UK iTunes uh, and I guess in Australia, according to what I was told, uh, but still hadn't popped up in the U.S. I, I haven't checked the last, you know, since Friday when the the song came out, but it was not on U.S. iTunes uh, as of uh, Friday, so they didn't roll it out all over the world at the same time, which is kind of a little strange. But, but what's any- more surprising though is that it just sort of came out. Yeah. With with we never heard anything about this song. Well, there were. There were- I heard uh, I got I got rumors uh, a couple of days before that I couldn't and I couldn't hear or I couldn't find anything and I tried to 
get some confirmation and of course they wouldn't say anything so um but yeah it did, it did finally come up but yeah it just kind of popped out there um so anyway but the uh, i believe the cd's been available for pre-order from before that but the the previews hadn't come out until friday so in any event all right um also for um i just briefly mentioned that um i was listening to uh, an advanced copy of uh, Plastic Ono Band, uh, Yoko's Plastic Ono Band album, which is going to be released in November. And uh, it's the same as the Ryko Disc uh, version for those of you that have that. So, but um, that's a, a, that's for another time. That's a discussion for another time. We're not going to talk about Yoko today. Um, but we are going to talk, uh, given that we are just over a week on the day we're taping this from the election we're going to talk about the beatles and politics um and also social causes steve thank you ken but uh, let's start with the beatles themselves um they really kind of you know uh, laid the groundwork and were kind of pioneers at that time you know in the 60s because that was not something you did outside of bob dylan Nobody and and Joan Baez maybe, you know there wasn't a lot of pop music that was, you know, going social like that. And then you know here we here we get these uh, four guys that you know that initially looked like they were you know four you know smiley nice looking guys and they had a they had uh, deeper feelings you know they had. Uh, feelings about the world they had you know they had uh political leanings which you know kind of surprised people um uh, you know uh, i think uh, taxman was one of the original was one of the one, one of the first instances where we had that kind of uh idea i mean there were other there were other things too i mean they they mentioned drugs in in the songs you know like dr robert there's blackbird where, where which paul now says is race and i could swear i never heard that be i never recall that from back then and of course there's revolution which was you know john's big uh uh song about uh political change let me go around the table i'm uh i'm gonna uh, ken let's start with you on this um what do you think about uh, the Beatles? Let's keep it to the, the Beatles rather than solo. We'll talk to we'll talk solo in a uh, at the end of this. But what do you think about the Beatles and and politics, and and their you know political voice? Well, I didn't think you heard all that much about it mm-hmm. in the '60s. I mean, the main thing was, and it's understandable when you first break out as an artist, you don't want to be controversial in any way. And right. Brian Epstein was very aware of that. He didn't want the Beatles to talk about politics. And it was only a few years later, 66, when they started to say that they were against Vietnam. So uh, just the mere fact that they even said that, that was shocking for its time. But I don't really think it was something that was highlighted all that much. You know, you didn't really (laughs) think of the Beatles that way. No. Even still. I mean, maybe when Revolution came out, I think that was a, a standout song where, you know, it expressed political view there. Uh, even mentioning Chairman Mao in a song, I think, was uh, a bit shocking. Uh, right. But you, know, you were saying before about Bob Dylan and those people, you have to also mention Pete Seeger and, and Peter, Paul, and Mary and all the folk artists who were there for civil rights and uh, against Vietnam, too. But um, I think more of, in particular, John and Yoko, you know, when they went out and did the bed-ins and all, and all their campaigns for peace, more so than I would think of the Beatles as a group. That's me personally. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Al? Well, actually, uh, I, I'm kind of on the same wavelength with Ken here. And I have a quote here from 1963. In fact, it's on the um, – it's, the, the, it's from either 63 or 64. But it's, uh, but it's on the – it's from John Lennon, and it's in the John Lennon section on the Beatles story. The, uh, the documentary album that Capitol put out in late 64. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he says, politics, they have no message for me, nor for, uh, for any in our group. Uh, the bomb, nuclear disarmament, well, like everyone else, I don't want to end up a festering heap, but I don't 
stay up nights worrying. I'm preoccupied with life, not death. And um, also in uh, the second of uh, Ed Rudy's Beatles interview albums, uh, mm-hmm. the one uh, that was mostly recorded during the summer of 64, the, the, the summer tour, the U.S. tour in, in the summer of 64, there's, uh, there's a clip of John at a press conference. And, of course, they were being asked – at almost every press conference that summer, about you know who they uh, who they uh, preferred in the presidential election, Lyndon Johnson or Barry Goldwater, and John kind of jokingly says uh, in this one clip says uh, yeah Eisenhower, uh, I think he should get in again you know obviously knowing that he wasn't constitutionally able to uh, be elected for a third term and and then said. And that said, no, we we don't really have any preference. So they really were not, uh, certainly in those very early years, they were not overtly political at all. You know, mm-hmm. in fact, they even they even waited until they uh, uh, were in Toronto, and I think this was in '65 before they made their first uh, comment against the war in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And that came out more more strongly for it in in sixty six, but that was of course overshadowed by the whole by the whole Christ thing. So really, they they were not overtly political uh, in in any way at that point. And when when you think about it, it really was only uh, and this is you know much later in their uh, in their time as a group. It's it's really only John Lennon. That was really at all kind of um, political, and obviously revolution, as Ken mentioned, is the uh, is is the most obvious example uh, mm-hmm. of that uh, because that was and that was a perfect a perfect song for its time because it it reflected just how uh, conflicted a lot of us felt. Back there in the summer, in the summer of '68, you know, the Hey Jude and Revolution came out the week after the Democratic convention in Chicago, and mm-hmm. a lot of us were, uh, you know, very conflicted about, uh, you know, we we certainly wanted change, we wanted the war ended, but we were not really sold on um, uh, on violence. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, Tom Hayden, who just Passed away, passed away this, this right. past this past week, and was one of the Chicago Seven. Uh, even though he was put on trial for inciting inciting a riot at the at the Democratic convention, a riot that actually was precipitated by the police, he actually was a pacifist. Mm-hmm. You know? So so he had the same kind of political conflicts that I think a lot of us. A lot of us felt at that time, and certainly revolution reflected uh, reflected that. But other than that, other than revolution, there's really not very much in the in the Beatles canon, the Beatles group canon, that's really at all really political. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it really is the the years beyond beyond the Beatles, and really just. And John Lennon, and to a much lesser extent, Paul McCartney, who was involved with political activity. Mm-hmm. There were a couple. Uh, the Playboy interview in February '65 tried to uh, or touched on a couple of political topics. I, I think I think it mean uh, it mentioned uh, religion, it mentioned homosexuality, but I mean. Which I mean, Playboy interviews went all over the place anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, there there wasn't a whole lot of uh, there wasn't a whole lot of politics uh, early on. That's sure, um, and it wasn't until sixty five, sixty six when they really started to, especially with with the Revolver albums. Yeah, I have a slightly different point of view, although my point of view is more in retrospect than um, you know what we experienced at the time. At, at the time, we didn't really hear all that much about their politics until maybe 66 when the, it began coming out a little. But that said, we now know, for instance, about the contracts uh, that uh, 
uh, said that they wouldn't play for a segregated audience in Jacksonville, for instance. Um, the uh, Eight Days a Week film makes quite a big deal of that, and, and it was mm. a big deal. It, it was taking a social stance uh, on an issue that they could have stayed out of, you know, if they wanted to. I mean, other groups were. Nobody else was making a real big deal about it. In 66, um, even before they began speaking up at press conferences, which uh, apparently they told Epstein that they were going to do if asked, and naturally they were asked. When they were asked about the butcher cover, uh, you know, you know, what's that about? I think it was John who said that it's as relevant as Vietnam was the quote. And, you know, you can see he's, okay, we're talking about an album cover with dead babies, and, uh, you know, he's saying something. Uh, and, you know, and then in 66, they began actually talking a bit about the war, about civil rights. People asked them about civil rights, and then they talked about that. And then, you know, from then on, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're – Tax man, as Steve mentioned, I mean, that was definitely a political comment about taxation in England and the, um, you know, high rates that they were asked to pay and mentions, you know, prime ministers and you know, British politicians um, might not as meant, have meant as much to us in America, but we, we, I think we knew what they were talking about. And to the degree that we didn't know what they were talking about, it was pretty easy at the time to find explanations, you know, about the 95% tax rate in Britain, for example. And then, you know, you get up to, as, as we've all said, revolution. But revolution was a very contentious thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, yeah. and, and the fact that he did three of them is, you know, it's, it's, he's painting a big picture there um, where mm -hmm. Revolution 9 is actually sort of showing the revolution and it's terrifying. And, mm -hmm. you know, and what he's saying is, you know, when you talk about destruction, you can count me out. And then there's supposedly, you know, his ambivalence about out in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if you carry pictures of the reference to Chairman Mao is actually completely negative. Uh, you know, you carry pictures of Chairman Mao, you ain't going to make it with anyone anyhow. For people on the left, people on the left really took this as an affront, you know. And um, he was interviewed by that magazine Red Mole at the time and where they basically mm. went and said, what do you think, what are you saying here? You know, you're, you're against the revolution, you're against us, you're against everything that we would have thought you stood for. And he basically, you know, held his ground and said, you know, I, I, I agree things have to change, but if you're talking about revolution, you're not thinking it through. And, um, you know, but from yeah. there on, you know, it was – you begin to see lots of little things like um, in the continuing story of Bungalow Bill, the, you know, the tiger hunter or the elephant hunter, you know, there's that – impression of, you know, is sort of a negative thing, you know, of just shooting these animals. And, you know, he sort of in a way got to that before Paul. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the, the, the peace campaign, you know, really was kind of, I think, of an, an outgrowth of, of all these discussions around revolution and what's going on and everything. And although the peace campaign, as we think of it as a, a solo effort, it began while the Beatles were together and mm -hmm. the rest of them answered for it, too. When, you know, when they were asked, it was sort of clear that they were behind it as well. So, yeah, you know, I think there was more political stuff going on than we knew about at the time or, you know, uh, they were, I think, subversively getting messages through and, until they were so big that no one, no one was going to be able to tell them not to do it as Epstein did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, of course, the, you know, the, uh, the Jesus quote from Lenin that caused all sorts of craziness in America, especially. Well, that's true. And God, and, and uh, I mean, can you imagine, uh, given what we've been going through the last couple of months, can you imagine what that would have been like now? I mean, you know, had to have a star of, of that magnitude at a time when, you know, when entertainers didn't really talk about things like religion for somebody to come out and, and to say what John was. And I remember the reaction. The reaction was nuts. It was absolutely, I mean, it makes some of the stuff that's going on today 
I mean, it probably ranks up there with the craziness of the stuff that's going on today. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make any political comments either way. But I mean, there were just it was it was the reaction was just crazy because you know the establishment was what was ran things and and for somebody to talk against the establishment like that in those days mm-hmm. was just was just nuts and i mean i remember i know i heard it as a kid from a, you know you heard adults saying well, what is this guy Lennon doing what is he doing he's you know blah 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 and and i don't remember hearing anything in church about it but i'm sure there were there were ministers and pastors that said something about it in church too i mean and, yeah and, well, actually most of them agreed with him because <laughs> oh, okay. this yeah because that was yeah. that was at at a point in time in fact it was about about a month after the interview that he did with Maureen Cleave when it first appeared in the London mm-hmm. Evening Standard was uh when Time magazine had a cover story saying is god dead Right, mm-hmm. and, and there were, there which were is doing, right in line with you know with what uh, with what John was saying, and so okay. a lot of clergy, in fact, said, "Yeah, you know the you know pop stars are more popular than Jesus now." Oh, well, uh, you know two, the the were, really the you know the real re, the the real bad reaction was because of the fact that that you know that the out of context quote had been fed to Bible Belt radio stations mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, you know, which is the height of, of, uh, of hypocrisy because these were, you know, this is in, in, a, in parts of the country where, you know, uh, you know, we don't want, you know, uh, we won't let black people uh, have, have equal rights, but, you know, don't, don't say anything against Jesus, mm-hmm. you know, that well, sort of yeah. thing. Right, and there were there were two there were two different streams of reaction to that for sure. There were the religious people who thought who, who thought what he said was horrible, and didn't. Well, no, they they the religious people. No, but there no there they, were people they, that they didn't they didn't they yeah most, I, most yeah, religious I, pe- people at the time were saying yeah he's right. Mm, I I disagree with you because I was uh, in. I was in parochial school at the time. The nuns didn't take very kindly to that. I'll tell you that now. Um, and anybody, I, there were, there were, there was a stream of thought. It was very, and I'm not talking about the people, you know, the the southern, the the southerners who, you know, demanded uh, that, you know, tried to try and burn Beatle records. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, the only thing. Only thing about that is, is that. This happened in August. You would not have been in school. <laughs> so, hmm. but, so, there well, have, so there couldn't have been too much reaction from... Uh, well, maybe I'm talking about a personal... Maybe in my personal life. Uh, but I seem to remember a lot of negative reaction. In, in, I seem to remember a lot of negative reaction. And it wasn't... It wasn't there were... Uh, I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who would feel that way. That uh, it, not everybody took it as open-mindedly as you're suggesting i mean that would be, it would have been very nice but i don't think everybody was that open-minded so um by the way you know what, what's that. what's completely right. overlooked in in all of that is that in the in the very same interview he said something like uh you know jews entertain uh, invented the entertainment industry it's part yeah. of their religion and and there's right. the only reaction i've ever seen to it is at one press conference someone asked you know quoted it to him and said would you like to comment on that and he just said no yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> wow Wow, but but the anyway. Beatles being bigger than Jesus, I don't look at it as being an anti-establishment stance. I think he was just yeah. reflecting what was going on and just saying right. it. And as as they said in that you know famous press conference, Paul said that they were deploring that fact. So yeah, that was wasn't certainly like, that uh, was some kind that of, was that was their spin. But there was a lot of negative reaction. I I, I remember that very well. Maybe because I was you know I'm, I, maybe I'm showing my age, but. Hell, I'm. I mean, 
you got to remember a little of that. It oh, I remember. Home. I remember it very clearly. That's why. Yeah. That's why I'm telling you that. Uh, you know, aside. From, I mean, there was obviously some. You know, media, and of course, again, this is the. You know, the thing that the media in 1966 was. You know, overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly middle aged, and you know, uh, jumped on anything, uh, anything negative. So obviously some of the media uh, or, well, there wasn't that, that much electronic media that would have been covering it, but uh, certainly the press jumped on it. Um, and that, and, right. And that's why Lenin was forced to apologize, which he didn't, you know, which we, he probably uh, – who was it that said, you know, he uh, – or, or Paul said it in, in uh, eight days a week that – you know, he was he felt horrible about having to do that, but that's yeah. what ha- that's that's what he was forced to do, right. and and so yeah, I mean, I, it, it, there was a you know the establishment came down heavily on them, and I'm not just talking about the burning of the and all the way around. I mean, that's what happened. But in any event, all right. So we've we've established the fact that the Beatles did get political in their later years. Once they got into the solo stuff. The politics did continue, although one of the Beatles obviously was a lot more political than the rest of them, and that was Lennon. And you know, it had to, you know, Lennon and Yoko. I mean, the bed ins, the you know, the public statements, you know, everything, the protests, they were very political. And and of course, Yoko still uh, does that today. But I, but I think to a certain extent, they all were. I mean, they all have gone. They've all done political stuff. Not much. Uh, uh, well, not much, but there are there are. You know, in 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 George's case, really, other than the concert for Bangladesh, which was more of a humanitarian gesture, it was not a political statement. Mm-hmm. He really stayed away from politics, uh, pretty much exclusively. And Ringo, aside from a few kind of, you know, not all that well-known causes that he's that he's been for, you know, ecological causes, uh, you know, I mean, the peace and love, you know, philosophy is is fine, but he's never really been overtly political. It really was just John and to a much lesser extent, Paul. Mm-hmm. Ringo did come out against, uh, well, f- in favor of Brexit, uh, the the recent. Oh um, yes, right. Uh, that was uh, that. Was, he sounded like he really didn't understand what what was yeah, going on there. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But you know, he did come out and express a, a, a definite opinion about it, and even gave a reason. Although, as 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 you say, it wasn't. A very well reasoned reason, and in George's case, you're right. He was more uh, interested in humanitarian causes. Um, in addition, exactly. there was the uh, Romanian Angel appeal. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you know he may have had political feelings about you know the dispute between you know Pakistan and Bangladesh and uh, mm. and and everything. But he didn't he didn't really get into that. And you know, and also the fact that that. Ravi Shankar was also sort of behind that, and Ravi Shankar mm-hmm. is an Indian, and Bangladesh and Pakistan, or you know, you've got that sort of Hindu versus Hindu versus Muslim thing going, and mm-hmm. and yet they kept out of that completely. They didn't deal with it as, you know, as the, some of the religious issues that were definitely flashpoints in those countries. They looked at it. They didn't get into that at all, and uh, and and dealt with it simply as an issue of people were suffering because of flooding and famine and all kinds mm-hmm. of you know other other issues that were going on, mm-hmm. and, and purely as a humanitarian thing. Um, right. The Romanian Angel Appeal too, you know that that also, I mean, the the, the whole problem had to do with uh, you know, political issues. But they left the political issues aside and just dealt mm-hmm. with the, the orphans and, and that kind of thing. So, yeah, George, I, I'm not sure, apart from, I guess, Taxman, I'm not sure what to say about uh, whether he's been overt in, in any of his political feelings. Well, George also did that one concert in England where he was supporting the Maharishi right, right. when he was running for what political office was it? Remember? I'm yeah. not sure. I'm not sure if it was a Maharishi himself or a party that the Maharishi um, 
was supporting. It was. It like oh, you're talking. Is that the is that the party? Uh, the one that uh, Mike Love was part of. The um, I can't remember it now. Um, because mm-hmm. Mike Love was a part of a a party that was associated a political party that was associated with the Maharishi, and yeah. I can't remember. Yeah, I want to say something it. like the Whole Life Party or something like that. I can't right. remember what mm-hmm. it actually was, but yeah, they, we're talking about the concert in nineteen ninety one, ninety two. That one or, or yeah something yeah yeah that yeah. one yep. yeah so okay that that was you know supporting a, a a party cause but I don't think anybody really knew what the party really was doing yeah so mm. <laughs> uh, it was like the very but silly does, party <laughs> but right but he does have uh, I mean Harrison's name is is on uh, a UNICEF fund today which is again more humanitarian than anything right. else mm. but that is out there so. Um, you know, to that extent, his name um, continues, you yeah. know, to, to be associated with humanitarian causes. Paul, of course, uh, give Ireland back to the Irish. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, he's also, uh, I mean, he's made comments about political candidates. He was pictured with Hillary Clinton a couple of months ago. Right. Um, he did the he did a uh, he fundraiser did, for. It. Right. He mm-hmm. did a fundraiser for with John Monjovi and a couple of other people. Few other people. Um, I should mention that Harrison went to the Gerald Ford White House. Um, for that's right. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> right, that's right too. There, there's that picture of uh, of George and Ravi Shankar and and uh, Billy Preston. Billy Preston, right? There were several other people there for that. Uh, and John went to the Jimmy Carter's inauguration. Uh, John and Yoko did. Um, mm-hmm. So. And Paul I, also wrote I, I, Big Boys Bickering. Which right. really, you know, is a commentary oh, about politicians, sure. yeah. you know, not getting along, just, you know, fighting with each other, not getting anything done. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he'll um, write something, something, like write something this year. I wonder if he'll write something this year. <laughs> Ooh, lady, you ought to do it quick. If yeah, I was going to say, yeah. uh, probably would have already happened. Uh, yeah, yeah. And don't forget that Paul also helped organize the concert for New York. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right. Oh, you know, yeah. That was oh, just so important. Thank you. And, yeah. uh, you know, and, and, and during yeah, I did and did the song Freedom, wrote it for that occasion, right? right. And right. during the uh, the the dreaded uh, the dreaded Heather Mills period, um, you know, he did th- through her did do a fair amount of work regarding the uh, uh, prevention of landmines, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and also the uh, the. the to try to stop the clubbing of seals, right, right, right. And, yeah. you know, in the in the around the north uh, the North Pole and all, and and I suppose the veg- oh, vegetarian thing, the meat free Monday thing, oh, kind sure. of borders yeah. on on political too. Although it's would, kind, yeah. of, well, he does uh, yeah. he does periodically show up at environmental conferences and mm-hmm. and meetings to talk about uh, the environmental consequences of raising meat for you know eating mm-hmm. use and uh so that that actually it, it does it does edge into the political too right and you have and to certainly give social McCartney a lot of credit oh yeah too you know for championing animal rights and uh putting out the vegetarian uh frozen food line sure and, absolutely uh, yeah he hasn't he hasn't been as much into the animal rights thing now as he used to be he's kind of backed away from that a little bit i know that um uh, he uh, there was a time when well, well, I saw him at uh, Hollywood Bowl that night. Uh, they were giving out the PETA DVDs, uh, the, the the one that he narrates about. Uh, um, you know, you guys know the one I'm talking about. I'm sure mm-hmm. the, the, uh, about the uh, the meat factories. Um, so I mean, he's he's kind. Of, it seems like he's kind of backed away from that. Of course, he. Uh, you know, he he did that benefit PETA benefit several years ago, right? Uh, so, you know, but there's another there's another thing that he's done a lot of, and so. writing songs about animal cruelty. Yes, uh, looking for changes. Would right, be one of right. those songs. Long leather coat is another one. Yeah, same right. time period, really. Mm-hmm. That uh, right. flowers in the dirt period. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, you know, we kind of passed over Ringo a little bit. And we all, you know, but well, I, I mean, kind of, ha- uh, you were saying that basically he really, you know, other than, you know, coming out for a few, you know, ecological things. And, and as Alan mentioned, the one comment about Brexit, which probably was ill-advised, you know, other than the, you know, the piece, the whole peace and love 
philosophy, he really has not been overtly political at all. Mm-hmm. You know, he did play at Bangladesh, of course. Well, again, that's not you know that's not a political statement. That's simply playing at a concert that was you know a humanitarian gesture. Mm-hmm. He's he's really never made any uh, you know any really overtly political statements. Well, if you're gonna uh, if you equate the the Jesus statement that Lenin made, I mean, uh, he did talk about God in a in a movie uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which surprised the hell out of everybody because nobody thought Ringo cared about God at all, and apparently, and he does. So, well, that, you know, that's not po- that's not politics. Well, depending on depending on the on the group you travel in, it it could be, but um, but yeah, no, I under I, I get you know I get what you're saying there, but mm-hmm. I'm just saying he he you know he did go into the opinion area, which he usually doesn't do. You're right, he's not really kind of an opinionated guy. He's he basically stays out of everything controversial, yeah. you know, He's not, unless, you, unless you call peace and love, peace and love controversial, you know. Oh, yeah. no, not at all. Who can, you know, who can quibble with that? He's not a spokesperson yeah. for anything political. No. But it is important to bring up the peace and love thing because for the past seven years, he's held an event on his birthday worldwide where he wants to say the words where we can all say it at the same right. time. So he's bringing attention to that. He says those two words, peace and love, three words really, uh, in every single interview. Sure. He right. always ends everything with peace and love. And he ends his concert saying peace and love. So he's carrying that message, and it's, it's evidently extremely important to him. And he's also, and he's gone up to, uh, I don't think he does it every year, but he has gone up to Iceland when Yoko has lit the, um, the uh, Imagine, Imagine Peace Tower. Tower. Right, yeah, I, was just, I just thought of it. They imagine Peace Tower. So he has supported her in that. And actually, you know, I'm surprised that the two of them don't get more, are, aren't linked more with the with their peace efforts, although Yoko's are more distinct than his is. But I think there's there's a little bit of connection there between the two of them as far as that goes, that they, you know, that they are both pushing for peace in different ways. But... You know, I, I think that, need, and I and I wouldn't be at all surprised if Ringo's motivation had to be had to do just a little bit with John. And I don't think that gets. I mean, he doesn't say it, but of course, I mean, that's really the conclusion you can draw that that's where it's connected. Uh, well, he, he does. He does use "Give Peace a Chance." You know, in his, very in his concerts. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. So yeah, that's that is true. Um, that is true. So, but really, there's there's a lot to talk about where John is concerned. Of course, so. because "Give Peace a Absolutely. Chance" was an anthem, sure, <laughs> right? You know, and it was sung yeah. in front of the uh, the Washington Monument. You know, in yeah, front of well, how many people? <laughs> yeah, well, like half I mean, a million we, people. We did what a whole almost a whole show with Kid O'Toole uh, regarding her uh, her piece on uh, on the you know the the advertising campaign that. Mm-hmm. Really was the you know the the peace campaign with the bed ins with give peace a chance, you know, uh, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's right. there's there's just there's there's so many things. Uh, I mean, that whole thing about the immigration thing. I mean, that was very overtly political. Oh, I mean, of course. Oh, sure. Uh, and that was you know. Uh, I mean, you couldn't get more political than that in the middle of the uh, Nixon administration. I mean, that was that was frightening. I mean, that, not just what happened to John, but just the whole atmosphere at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, people have talked about instances in more recent years about that kind of thing with, you know, government spying. But it was really absolutely going on then. There's no – the paranoia – the the I keep thinking of the uh, Stephen Stills line paranoia strikes deep. That was very true back then in the late sixties. No question about it. Mm-hmm. Well, there the 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 Nixon administration's persecution of John and their efforts to throw him out of the country really can be you know included in the whole uh, what uh, John Mitchell called the White House horrors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know that included the included Watergate and uh, and the cover. Up and and everything else and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, it <laughs> it's 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 pretty scary. 
Yeah, all the all when you look back on it, all the President's Men was on Turner Classic Movies uh, recently, and I know there were lots of comments on Facebook. I know I mentioned it because I really love the movie, but but there were a lot of comments from people who had never seen it and never Mm -hmm. realized what happened at the time, and that movie really gives only a partial view of what was going on. I mean, there were some, it was some scary times and John and Yoko were in the middle of that and that yeah. they came out in one piece, uh, you know, is due in, in large part to Leon Wiles, who, uh, his, his attorney, but also, you know, mm-hmm. the, their, their own personal strength in their relationship. And, you know, uh, people are, are still to this day, you know, very, there's a lot of criticism of Yoko, but damn it. I mean, if it wasn't for her, um, and, uh, you know, and him also, but I mean, if it wasn't for their relationship and the strength of their relationship, they wouldn't have gotten out of that alive. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. So. Well, uh, you got, you got to remember that right in the middle of all of that was, you know, their 18 month separation. Right. So, so they weren't that much of a united front, you know. A lot of well, that, during, you know, during, lot, uh, during the wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, during the the thing with 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 uh, the immigration when they were fighting for the green card, they were together. Well, when they when when he got the green card, right? But but much of the like in seventy four and the early part of and the early uh, the very early part of seventy five, mm-hmm. um, you know, they were they were and and part of seventy three, they were separated. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, so John was going through a lot of that, you know, on his own. Mm-hmm. And the thing yeah. to remember, really, and I'm only saying this because I think we may have some younger people listening to the show, maybe some mm-hmm. millennials who may mm-hmm. not understand why John went through all this persecution yes. uh, is because of the fact that he was looked upon as being a threat to the Nixon right. administration because right. he'd be an influence on the youth. And that was right around the time when uh, the voting age was mm-hmm, lower. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So that's the main reason why that all happened. So, yeah, I'm looking at I'm looking at a quote from John, and I suspect this is probably early on in the Beatles days, where he said, "We're not disinterested in politics. It's just that politicians are disinteresting," and it's and it's very ironic how that changed. Very ironic how that changed for all of them, not just for him, not just for him. So, in any event, go ahead, Ken. Make, I just think ahead. it's very important to point out one thing because of um, one particular issue of many that's brought up in this uh, presidential election is women's rights. Um, mm-hmm. John changed so much uh, from the person who at one time said uh, women should be obscene and not hers yes. to uh, <laughs> being very heavily influenced by Yoko and being very much a feminist. Hence, Mm -hmm. recording the song Woman is the Negro of the World. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he'd certainly be right there today championing women's causes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've been keeping an eye on the clock, and we are just about out of time, gentlemen. I'm going to start with saying if you'd like to get a hold of the show, um, you can write to us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can tweet us at at sign things we said fab we would dearly dearly appreciate that if you especially love this show and we know you all do that you would you would review us on itunes we would very much appreciate that please um and i'm gonna uh you can get a hold of me at beatles examiner at gmail.com i have my own personal facebook page where i where i will tell you that uh, up until at least the election, I will talk, be talking about Beatles and other things. And, uh, but I do have a non-political Facebook music group uh, called Beatles News and Commentary, where you are welcome to join and talk about the Beatles and, you know, and whatever Beatle thing catches you. Um, So I'm going to start to, I'm going to go around the table, starting with Alan. Alan, where can people get a hold of you? Um, probably the easiest uh, way to do that is through Facebook, either on my regular page, Alan Cozen, or on Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. And, and, Al? and, and remember okay. to vote. <laughs> there we go. Yes, very much so. Remember to vote. Al, your turn. 
Okay, uh, you can uh, get in touch with me on on Facebook uh, at Al Sussman or on Twitter at ASUSS49, and I don't do politics, um, you know, uh, deliberately. <laughs> Okay. It, just takes, it just takes up too much time, and uh, you know, even though I'm a political junkie myself, it just uh, I, don't, I just don't feel the uh, the need to okay. uh, to do political arguments on, uh, on on social media. But yes, definitely go vote. Okay, Mr. Michael, so would you like to uh, put in your uh, final word? Uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, my email address is every little thing at att.net. You can also join me on my Facebook page under Ken Michaels. There's a photo of me, my wife, my son with Todd Rundgren. That's how you know it's me. And also on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. As I usually say uh, in every show, there's a Beatles trivia and games page every single week. There's Beatles trivia. You can win one of nine prizes. I do have new CD from the Weaklings to give away with all four guys signing the CD. And I also have, I don't know if any of you guys have read this yet, but Brian Wilson has a new book out. It's called I Am Brian Wilson. It's mm-hmm. his memoirs. And mm-hmm. I have one mm-hmm. copy of the book to give away. Mm-hmm. And, and you're not giving it to me? <laughs> Dang. I'm surprised you don't have it. No, I don't have it yet. And you're I not giving away it. Mike Love's book? Uh, no, no. I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> not every- I wonder <laughs> why. Said- not after what he said about Paul McCartney at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, no. Right. Ooh. All right. <laughs> See what you get, Mike Lev? Darn. But um, also, like everyone else said, please go out and vote. If you don't vote, then you have no right to complain. All right? Yeah. So go out and do it. Um, and I will, re- I will reiterate that. Go out and vote. One more thing. Um, I mentioned Alan's book, but... Uh, Al and I, uh, I didn't mention Al's book, um, and uh, I didn't mention mine. Um, I have a, an ebook called Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Uh, it's very cheap. It's uh, available at Amazon. And Al, uh, tell them about your book. Uh, it's uh, Changing Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation, about a very uh, change-filled 101 days between November 22, 1963 and March 1, 1964. Okay, and Alan, you actually have two books. Go ahead. ahead. I do. Um, The one is called The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop. Uh, It's a regular book. Uh, You can get it at Amazon or anywhere, published by Fiden. And the other is an e-book called Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, published by New York Times Books. There we go. Okay. Well, it looks like we are down to the, the end of another show. Thank you for listening and your continued loyalty to things we said today. And we hope you will be with us again next week when we will all be back here yelling and screaming and talking, talking about the Beatles. I don't know what we're going to talk about. Do we know? We don't know what we're going to talk about next week yet, do we? So you will learn with us what we are going to talk about next week <laughs> when you when you come. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. This is Steve Marinucci for Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen, and Al Sussman saying thank you for listening and go vote. And we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.